Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night broadcast. Tonight I wanted to go through, we've been looking at some, some of the prophecies. I wanted to go through Daniel chapter 12. We're going to be covering that and uh, Matthew 24 and several other things this weekend at the conference in Emporia, which is on our website. Uh, but basically, there's some interesting things in chapter 12 that most people totally overlook. We've talked about them a little bit before, but let's just start by uh, going through it. Let me pull up uh, Esword. And there we go. So this is Daniel 12. Let me just start by um, actually looking at here. So in Daniel, you've got uh, basically 9, 10, 11, and 12 are kind of all the same idea. So in chapter 9, you've got the prayer and then the prophecy of the coming of Messiah, which if we had time to look at, we would see comes out to be uh, April of 32 AD. And so that is an amazing timeline prophecy. And then chapter 10, we're given some more details of the end times and their times. So very interesting. Chapter 11 is a very interesting chapter because it starts with, as it says, the first year of Darius the Mede. And so it's when Babylon falls to the Medes and Persians. And it goes through the time period of all of the Medes and the Persians rule into Alexander the Great coming, his kingdom breaking up into four pieces. And so we have Syria and Egypt to the north and the south troubling Israel. And it maps out all of their people and their kings until the time of the Romans coming. And then under the time of the Romans, the temple gets destroyed and the nation is dispersed. So that's all in chapter 11. And then it continues. So for it to continue after the Romans destroy the temple and that guy comes in and stops the sacrifices and does things in a temple, obviously they come back, which is 1948 take back the Temple Mount, which is 1967, and then sometime in the future, build a temple, start sacrifices, and then the other part can happen. But it goes on and talks about the things that the Antichrist will do. And so we go all the way down with this, and it gets to the part where we'll look at this last verse here. It says, he, talking about the Antichrist, shall plant his, or the tabernacles of his palace, between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now that first part, we won't really have time to talk about that either, but this first part is really interesting when you look at it in Hebrew. It's basically saying his headquarters, okay, are going to be between two seas and the holy mountain, which is Jerusalem. So you can triangulate between the seas two or three places where this might be. And of course, it turns out to be the West Bank uh, in that area. And when it says the tabernacles of his palace, when you look at that in Hebrew, it could be that. It could also be the name of the city where he actually ends up. And since he, Antiochus Epiphanes and the other guys are mirroring this, it's the same area and it happens to be the same area in the West Bank. So to my knowledge, the city... And I haven't checked it in a few years, but to my knowledge, the city hasn't been built or if it is built, it hasn't been renamed or whatever. But anyway, so this whole thing ends with the Antichrist coming in, middle of the tribulation, taking over, and then other details from not this chapter, but the wars. And then the Messiah comes back and kills him. So this last part here, chapter 11 ends with, yet he... The Antichrist, who can't be stopped by human means, will come to his end, and none shall help him. And so, this is an interesting thing. So, with Daniel 11, then, we go from 536 BC, past the destruction of the temple, past the Roman expulsion, and then 1948 forward, and then into the future. And a lot of people say this is all about Antiochus Epiphanes. And obviously it's not. The early church fathers that were disciples of the apostles said this was referring to the Antichrist. The Dead Sea Scrolls tell us that anything in the major and minor prophets has got something to do with future prophecy towards the, the second coming of the Messiah. So we understand those things if, if we follow directions. 
So don't listen to people who tell you, ah, oh, whatever. It just probably is all done and over with. Parts of it are, but even those parts that are, are pictures and types of things that are coming later. But anyway, so to set the stage for this, for chapter 12, we are talking about a time when the Antichrist is ruling, causing trouble, and he comes to his end. So we know that as the seven-year tribulation period. And back in chapter 9, with the prayer, uh, there's the 70 weeks prophecy. And there's 69 weeks of years from a decree to when the Messiah is cut off. And then we clearly see the Messiah cut off the dissolution of the destruction of the temple, the dissolution of Israel. And so then for this last verse, chapter 29, or chapter verse 27, rather, it, it has to be reversed. So they have to come back in their land. They have to reestablish their country. They have to uh, take back the Temple Mount, reunify Jerusalem. Then they have to build a temple, and then they have to start sacrifices. So all but the last two are done. But we're talking about this, that it's a seven-year period. We see the same thing in First Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians 2 and other places. But now for our study tonight, with that in mind, that's a basic outline and chapter 11, again, ends with the Antichrist will be here, do horrible things, but he will be destroyed. So now this is the end part of it, but it's a continuation of that whole thought. And so Daniel is talking with angels and he sees visions and he asks questions. And so he wants to know when is this rapture and Antichrist guy and can we put some dates on this stuff, that kind of thing. So it says this, then we'll start with verse 1, and this is only uh, 13 verses, but very, very interesting when you really pull it all together. So verse 1 says, at that time, Michael shall stand up. Now we're going to see in a minute, it's really obvious, this Michael stands up at the beginning of the tribulation period. Now we do see Michael going to war with Satan and throwing Satan out of heaven, in Revelation chapter 12. And some people have connected those together. Michael stands up and goes to war. So this has got to be talking about the second half of the tribulation period. So if there is a rapture, obviously it's mid-trib, that kind of a thing. And what we've got to understand is you got to look at the wording very, very carefully. We're going to see several examples of that in this chapter. But when it says stand up, uh, we have to understand what that means. Uh, you've probably heard things like um, somebody's making fun of you and you have a Christian witness. So stand up, act like a man. You know, there's all these different idioms. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Put your big boy pants on. There's all different ways of saying it, but it means don't just walk away and hide. Somebody came against you. Stand up and fix the problem. So in this case, Michael, the prince of Israel, is going to stand up or take a stand. So in this case, just looking at this, it could be pre, mid, or post-trib. It could be a totally different time. But somewhere along the lines, Michael stands up. Now, that doesn't mean that he immediately starts a war. And I think what we're going to see is in, in, I do believe chapter 12 is in the middle of the tribulation period. Maybe not exactly in the middle, but in the middle somewhere. Um, and that begins the time of wrath and stuff like that, that that's talked about in here also. So we're going to see that this is very clearly a pre-trib event when Michael takes his stand or takes his authority. Remember in uh, Peter and in Jude and those places that talk about uh, the apostates in the latter times, one of the examples given is that Michael, this, this angel here, dared not take a railing accusation against himself, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. And this was at the event when Satan was trying to take the body of Moses. Now, you and I both know Satan has no business with the body of Moses. A anybody with half a brain knows that. But is it your authority, your responsibility to fix the problem? No, it is not. Was it Michael's? Not at that time. At a certain time, the Lord's going to say, Michael, stand up. Anybody who comes against Israel, 
destroy. And then at another time, he's going to say, Michael, I want you to take Satan, bind him head and foot, cast him in the pit. When the Lord says that, he will be very glad to do so. But he dares not do that now. I mean, is it right Satan's walking around doing what he's doing? In a sense, no, but the Lord may be using it. So you don't overstep your bounds. This is that whole concept of waiting. Even though you know something's not right, it may not be your responsibility to fix it. It all depends on what the Lord's doing. So at this time, there's a certain time when Michael begins to stand up for the children of Israel in a time of trouble is basically what we're talking about. Now it says, at a certain time, Michael will stand up, the great prince, which stands for uh, the people of your, or the children of your people. So he's standing for them and authority over them. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. So we see that phrase all the way through the Old Testament in many places. The idea that there's going to be a certain time in human history that is the worst time that has ever been. There's never been a time before this bad, and there never will be a time later when it's this bad. This is as bad as it gets. Okay, and that's the time that we're referring to. It's mentioned several times. And in those other places, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of tribulation. And there's several other terms for it. The Dead Sea Scrolls talk about it. They call it the time of visitation. And there's a few other words too. So this is a time of trouble. So the time of trouble is the worst time ever. And so we know that to be the seven-year tribulation period. And I know post-trib or uh, mid-trib people are going to say, well, the worst time of that period is the last part. And that's probably true. But we're talking about a time of Jacob's trouble when Michael stands up. So we're going to very clearly see this here in a second. So um, at that time, so when Michael stands up and the time of trouble begins, whatever that is, at that time, your people shall be delivered. Now, this word for delivered can mean several things. It's, it's basically the equivalent of sozo in Greek. It's to be delivered, to be saved. Uh, if, you were, if you'd fallen off a cliff and were dangling by a rope and about ready to lose your grip and you were going to die, and I reached over and pulled you up, I delivered you. I saved you. Got nothing to do with your spiritual salvation, but I saved you. So it can be used a whole bunch of different ways. So their, their people at that time will be saved somehow in some form and who exactly are his people it says everyone that shall be found written in the book now it's not real specific but i think you know what we're talking about in revelation it talks about the books were opened and the people that are saved or those that believe in messiah their names are written in the lamb's book of life so in the book of life there are the book of the Gentile sinners, which is what we're all born, born into and our names are in there. And then there's the book of the damned or the, the uh, cursed, the, the unsaved. So if you accept Christ as your savior, your name is blotted out in the books of the Gentiles, the just wicked, the regular sinners and written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you never accept him as savior, when you die, your name is blotted out of the savior of the uh, Gentile sinners book and is put in the book of death or the book of the damned. So you have this ability to make choices and get saved and this kind of stuff while you're still living. Once you're dead, if you didn't make a decision, the decisions made for you. And so we see this in Revelation, the books were opened and then there besides the multiple books, there is the Lamb's book of life. So in this case, there's a group of people, their names are written in the book of life. That means they're messianic, they're believing in the Messiah, uh, they're saved. And at that time, they will be delivered. Now, if you put this in normal New Testament concepts, we're probably talking about a rapture, a deliverance of some sort. So he defines it, though, in the next verse. It says, many of them that sleep 
in the dust of the earth. Who actually sleeps in dirt? I mean, down under the earth, you know. We're talking about people that have died. So sleeping in the dust of the earth are dead people. When they awake out of their sleep, it's a resurrection. So we're talking about the resurrection of dead believers, basically, sometime in the future, at least in the future of Daniel's time. So he says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And then he kind of starts talking about resurrection in general. Some are resurrected to eternal life and some to everlasting uh, shame and, and everlasting contempt. So there's good. There's two types of resurrection. The first type of resurrection is the resurrection of uh, life. So we've had some people resurrect and die again. That's kind of different. It's like a resuscitation. So that's in the Old Testament. But uh, the first group of people that died and ascended were those that resurrected with Jesus, according to Matthew. And then there'll be a rapture. So it's not like it's the very first time it's ever happened. Enoch was raptured. Uh, Elijah was raptured in that sense, just changed and caught up. So these are all uh, times when people will resurrected or raptured, changed and, and caught up uh, of the first kind. The second time is basically like at the white throne judgment. Every the rest of the dead are all resurrected, judged. And those that are not found written in the book of life are thrown in the lake of fire. So two types there. And he's talking about the fact that eventually everybody gets resurrected one way or the other. So you don't have to worry about being cremated or falling off of a boat and get eaten by sharks and your body's gone. It doesn't matter. It will be resurrected, guaranteed. The question is, what will you do in eternity? Are you a believer or not? So at this point, then we have this interesting thing. So Michael stands up which causes a time of trouble to start. And that's as bad as it's ever been. It's that seven-year tribulation period. At that time, the beginning of trouble, that's when people are delivered, either raptured, resurrected, something. Those that are found written in the book into everlasting life. Now, remember, Paul talks about the secret or the mystery in 1 Corinthians 15 is that when the resurrection occurs, the resurrected people will resurrect, but then in the twinkling of an eye, just like that, the dead in Christ will rise, and then we which are alive are changed and caught up with them. So we see that in 1 Corinthians 15 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So the next time we have a resurrection of the first kind, it won't be just a resurrection, it'll be a resurrection rapture. So we learn that from Paul. So look at this next one. Verse three is they which, um, yeah, they which shall be wise and who's wise, those that accept Messiah, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness, turning you to righteousness is getting saved, will shine as the stars forever and ever. So eternal life. But if you put these first three together, we have Michael standing up, starting the time of trouble. The time of trouble begins with a rapture resurrection, in which case these people are shining ones. This is not symbolic or a, a metaphor. This is literal. Remember when Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration and all of a sudden he was glowing and there was Moses and Elijah there with him. Then when he came back down, he had clothed his glory and somehow. So we're talking about a glorified body. So this first three verses are talking about a rapture resurrection that occurs before a time of trouble starts or right at the very beginning when it starts. Okay. So then it says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Now, I want you to look at this very carefully. So one, two, and three is sometime in the future, there is a rapture resurrection and a time of trouble starts. But now we're not talking about the time of trouble. We're actually talking about the time of the end. And those are two totally different things. They're connected. 
But the first thought is rapture, resurrection at the beginning of the time of trouble, whenever that is, when Michael stands up. Okay. Now, second thought is before that actually starts, there is a time of the end. So I'm submitting to you the time of trouble is the seven year tribulation period, which is the last seven years of the time of the end. The time of the end would be described as by Jesus as being the birth pangs. Remember when he says there's wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and earthquakes and all this stuff, but don't worry because the end is not yet. And then he begins to talk about nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Then the gospel is preached to everyone. Then the end will come. And the end is that series of events and that time of trouble. So the time of the end is a much bigger time period than seven years. So we're going to explain that and figure that out. So he's told 1, 2, and 3, verses 1, 2, and 3 are the main thought. Seal up the words. Don't talk about them. Just write them down. Seal them up and put them in the book until the time of the end. So we'll begin to understand them in the time of the end. When many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. So let me explain to you what we're talking about. That was always cryptic to me until I realized exactly what we are referring to. So let me go back and pull um, this up. Okay, so here's the here's the verse again. It's Daniel uh, three and four. Um, see, well, this last part here, four basically. Daniel, seal up the words or seal the book even to the time of the end. And this is just basic King James. Money will run to and fro or back and forth. They're running around looking for something. And when doing that, they are able to make their knowledge increase somehow. So that's the inscription. Now here's church father Irenaeus, and he explains what he thinks that means. Now remember, Irenaeus is a, is a disciple of Polycarp. And Polycarp worked with John the Apostle for well over 40 years in ministry. Knew John very, very well. Um, so this is a guy that's got secondhand information from the apostles. So here's what he says. The prophet Daniel says, and, and all the church fathers give a kind of a loose quote. They're, they're accurate, but they're just like a different, a different uh, uh, Bible translation or something. The prophet says, quoting Daniel 12, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of consummation. Now, we see that kind of a phrase like in uh, Matthew and Luke, uh, specifically in the passage where uh, Simeon is waiting on seeing the Messiah and Anna is in the temple. They're both in the temple and Anna is teaching prophecy. And it says they're talking about the teaching people about the redemption of Israel, the time of the redeemed. Messiah comes and creates the redeemed. That's the first coming and the consummation of their age. So all the first coming prophecies, they understood them very well and they were teaching them in the temple. So it's the time of end. It could be the end of their age or the end of our age. In this case, we're actually talking about the end of our age and I'll show you that in a minute. So he says, seal them up until our time period, whenever that time of the end begins, until many learn and knowledge be completed. Okay, so uh, instead of uh, running to and fro, many learn. Many learn by running back and forth. And I'm submitting to you, it's through archaeology. We learn things that we've forgotten or been lied to about. And knowledge will be increased or knowledge will be completed. There are certain questions we have about end time prophecy, uh, you may have questions on what or is not morality. Uh, did the translation of your Bible, is it a good one? What did the words really mean? So when you see text where the words are used over and over again, you get a feel for it and you know exactly what it means. So you know that you know correctly. So at this point, but look at what he says very carefully. So shut up the words even at the time of the end until many learn and knowledge is completed. For at that time, that's the time of the end or the time of the consummation, at that time, which is when 
the dispersion shall be accomplished. And that's kind of a funny old English way of saying it. But we're talking about the dispersion of Israel by the Romans. Because there is a captivity by the Babylonians, of which is in Daniel's time. Daniel is there in captivity. And then there is a dispersion. In both cases, they're outside of Israel. But the dispersion is the Roman occupation. And he's talking about the time of the end, after the Antichrist, after the Romans burned the temple, that kind of thing. We see that in chapter 11. So at that time, um, when the dispersion is accomplished or totally finished, that doesn't mean when the, when the nation is finally kicked out and the dispersion begins or the dias, time of diaspora begins. It's when it ends, when the whole thing is over with. So this is saying that at that time, when the time of the end begins, is when the Jews come back in their land. So that's 1948 A.D. That's when the time of the end began. Or as Jesus would say, that's when the birth pangs actually began. And since then, we have wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pestilences, and they just keep getting worse and worse. But now look what it says. When the dispersion is accomplished, 1948, they shall know all these things. So I... I Knew, known about this for a while, and I always thought he's saying, well, when the Jews come back in their land and they begin to fulfill prophecies, as soon as we get a few more prophecies fulfilled, you'll know exactly what those things mean, like a seven-headed red dragon or whatever. You'll know what the symbols mean, and if, if they're consistent, you'll instantly know the rest of the story. So it shouldn't be too hard when we get some more data, and the data begins to start coming in in 1948. Now, with that in mind, I'm submitting to you that it's the Dead Sea Scrolls because the Dead Sea Scrolls teach an amazing set of things. There is one Messiah with two comings. He, uh, the Messiah comes and actually dies for our sins. It reconciles us to God. It's an event called the beginning of the age of, or, uh, yeah, the age of grace or the day of Messiah. And it begins, the event where he fixes our sin nature begins in 32 A.D., which on their calendar is one Shemitah after the end of the ninth jubilee of the eighth Luna. So it, their calendar stuff is amazing for prophecy. And it goes on and talks about a lot of other things. And so far, all the prophecies that they gave and interpretations, they have commentaries on all the minor and major prophets. Um, they're rock solid and they're, they agree with Christian theology. So that really makes us stop and think. But now let's go down here. I want to show you one other prophecy so that we can kind of nail this together. This is Isaiah 29. And it just says this. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, which is Jerusalem, the city where David dwelt. Add year to year, let them kill the sacrifices. And yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. I will camp against thee round about. I will lay siege against you with a mount. And I will raise up forts against you. And you shall be brought down. So this is the Lord speaking through Jeremiah of a time when Israel is barricaded in the temple. And they're doing sacrifices saying, oh Lord, please help us. But the Lord's not pleased with them. And he's going to uh, have apparently somebody that's not Jewish. Somebody comes in, mounts against them, and just breaks through and destroys the city. And the whole system is brought down. They are destroyed and dispersed. So we know this to be um, 1940, or no, excuse me, uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. We know it's not the Babylonians because it's... Uh, a group of people laying siege. And we're going to see that a little bit further. And But God is against them, so it's not anything else. Now, in 1948, when they came back, there was a similar situation. All the nations surround them attacked them, okay? But they didn't have Jerusalem yet, so it doesn't really fit with Ariel. And the Lord apparently was with them this time because all of a sudden, within a few days, it was gone like it was a bad dream. And so we're talking this first couple of verses here is the 70 AD destruction of the temple and the 135 dispersion of Israel. Okay. Then it says, 
speak, you they will be brought down, but they will speak out of the ground. Their speech shall be low out of the dust. The voice shall be as of one who has a familiar spirit out of the ground, and the speech shall whisper out of the dust. So just like if you wanted to know the past and nobody knew anything about it, you'd have to have your grandfather tell you, well, he's dead. So, and ghosts don't come back and tell you things. But like that, grandfather's ghost coming back and telling me, grandfather can actually come here now and tell me, even though he's dead, if I find a writing that he wrote. And so we're talking about a series of writings that are in the ground, put in the ground at this time. So in 70 AD or right before, the people that knew the Lord wrote the truth, wrote the system down, wrote everything we need to know, and buried them. And we know those to be the Dead Sea Scrolls, the scrolls in the Qumran caves. But look at this next part. It says, moreover, the multitude of your strangers. Now, now we're switched somehow. First, Jerusalem is bad. God's against Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is brought down. And because of that, they bury these um, manuscripts. And then the manuscripts come out of the ground at some point and give us information. Well, when do they come out of the ground and give us information? At a different time, when the multitude of your strangers will, will be like the dust. Not you, but this time it's them. They will be like small dust. And their terrible ones will be like chaff that passes away. And it shall be in an instant suddenly. You will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake, great noise, storm, tempest, flame of devouring fire. The multitude of the nations, plural, that are at fight against Ariel, fight against Israel or Jerusalem, even all that fight against her and her munition and that distress her shall be like the dream of a night vision. You know, like when you're having a really bad dream and you're about ready to die and it's horrible, there's no way out and you're just dead. There's just no, no way around it. But then you wake up and realize it was a dream. Like, okay, it's all gone. That's what this situation is going to be like. So when we pull Isaiah 29 together, we have a time in 70 AD when God's against them. He lets an enemy destroy the temple and destroy them as a nation. They leave records in the dirt. And at a certain time, these records are found. And that's when another war happens in which God defends Israel. So that's their return from this first one. So that's 1948. And um, uh, Professor Yarden tells this story about how they'd learned about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, but they were expensive. They were trying to raise money to buy them. And to bring them back to the university. And it seemed like it took forever. But finally they were able to raise enough money. And then the morning that he was able to do it. He got the money. Went down. Bought the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And was going to take it back to the university. And on his way back. The same morning he found out he couldn't get there. Because apparently. Unbeknownst to him. He's a professor not in politics. But apparently Israel had declared themselves to be a nation. It was May 14th, 1948, and an, a war had just started. And so he took the scrolls elsewhere and hid them until after the war, which was only a few days, and it was over, like a bad dream. And so that was the start of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what's interesting about that is that scroll that he purchased, the very first one, was the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, which contained this particular prophecy. So saying all that to understand this, let's go back now to our text and we'll kind of fill in the blanks. Um, okay, where's my stuff here? There we go. Okay, so there's a time in the future when Michael stands up. There's a time of trouble, a seven-year tribulation period. And at that time when it begins, there is a rapture, resurrection, then it says, you shut up and seal the words. Don't worry about the rest of it because it needs to be sealed until the time of the end. So what's the time of the end? When many run to and fro in archaeology 
and knowledge is increased by reading the Dead Sea Scrolls, filling in the blanks. Eventually, all Israel gets saved. When Jews read the scrolls and begin to understand what they teach, there's a really good chance they become messianic. So he goes on, this is, this is great. We understand this now. Daniel doesn't quite. Daniel says, I looked, or uh, yeah, I looked and beheld. There stood two other angels, one on one side of the river and one on the other. And the one man clothed in linen, which was on the waters of the river, said, how long shall it be until the end of these things? Ooh, now we're getting dates. So this is cool. So, okay, there's a rapture resurrection when Michael stands for the place, starts the time of trouble. And before that, there is a gathering of Dead Sea Scrolls to tell us that the birth pangs have started and Israel is back in their land. So give me some dates with these. How do these all fit together? So the man clothed in linen that was on the waters of the river, he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, it shall be for a time, times, and a half. So a time is a year, basically, a, a sacred year. So it's a, a time is one year, times is dual, not plural, so it's two. And then a half is, is a half a year, six months. So it's three and a half years or 1260 days. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So that's the time period for something. Okay. And he describes it, the beginning and the ending. It says, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, these things will be finished. So. There is a time when there's a rapture resurrection, when Michael stands up and begins the time of trouble. Then there are, from that point, there is 300, or excuse me, 1260 days, the time, time of a half, at the end of which it says he shall scatter the power of the holy people. At the end of that time, there's going to be an intense persecution of Jews. Well, that doesn't sound like Messiah's second coming. That's something else, an intense persecution of Jews. Okay, so let's go on. He said, I heard, but I didn't understand. So I said, my Lord, what shall the end of these things be? Okay. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end, till 1948. Interesting. Okay, anyway, many shall be purified and made white and tried and none of the wicked, or the wicked shall do wickedly, but none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Those wise are those that accepted Messiah. So, and he, he gives us this. This is the rest of the clue. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination of desolation set up. Now, let's stop there just for a second. So, from the rapture resurrection... 1260 days, the time, time and a half, there's a persecution. Now we're talking about from the time of the abomination of desolation. Now, if we had time and we went to Matthew 24, we would see Jesus saying, when you see the abomination of desolation, as spoken by Daniel the prophet, this one, this particular thing, when you, if you're in Jerusalem and you see that, don't even bother to go get your stuff because you won't survive. You run and you flee somewhere, okay? And most of us think it's Petra or somewhere in Jordan for other reasons. Uh, but this is what's going on. So when you see the abomination of desolation, you have a very short time to get your family together and get out of there because an intense persecution is starting. So this intense persecution and the abomination of desolation is the same time period. So... From the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So there's an overlap. So 30 days before the intense persecution begins, somewhere in the middle of the tribulation period, the abomination of desolation is set up. Okay, so... Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335 days. That's something completely different we'll touch on in a minute. 
go your way until the end be, for you will rest and stand in your lot in the days, in the end of days. So when the end of days comes, there will be a resurrection. He will actually be standing in the lot of Messiah or the lot of Melchizedek as the Dead Sea Scrolls say. So let's pull this together. So how does all this work? Let me um, see if I've got that. What did I do with it? Yeah, this one. Okay, let me show you this. So here's the deal. So the last time, time and a half a time are 1260 years. So that starts uh, right here with the intense persecution and goes to the end, which would be the second coming. We also have 1290 days, which starts 30 days before the intense persecution, when the abomination of desolation is set up. So here's the 1290 days from that time period to the second coming. Now we have 335 days from the middle all the way to when something happens. And then there's also a 12, a 2300 days talked about in chapter eight, I believe. So pulling all this together, we're seeing number one, the main thing I want you to see from this is there is a rapture resurrection. There's 1260 days to the persecution, the abomination of desolation with a possible 30 day overlap, and then 1290 days further to the second coming. So when you look at it like that, it's obviously a pre-trib rapture. There's no way it could be mid or post or pre-wrath or anything like that. It's pre-trib. Okay, the other question a lot of people ask is, what about this 1335? In the 1335, we're talking about Moedim to Moedim. That's a Moedim is a festival. So most of us know that Jesus came and died on Passover. If you look at the ritual for Passover, it clearly paints a picture of the Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection to pay for our sin nature. Very, very clear. If we had all the rituals for the other festivals, we would know exactly what everything does and probably when things are happening. Not necessarily the year, but the day of the year and how it would happen and more details about it. So in this case, many people have tried to say, well, what about the 1290 and the, the 1260? Well, 1260 can go between many Moedim, like Passover to Pentecost or not uh, Rosh Hashanah, things like that. But there is nothing on the current um, Jewish calendar that you could start on a festival, go 1335 days and be on another festival. It just can't be done. It doesn't fit anywhere on that calendar. Well, now with the Dead Sea Scrolls, again, since knowledge has increased because many have went to and fro finding fragments, we now understand the Dead Sea Scroll calendar better. And when you look at that calendar, there is one place and only one place where you can start on a festival and go 1335 days and be on another festival. And that is if you start at uh, Yom Kippur and you go 1335 days, you end at Pentecost. Now, the interesting thing about this is that Pentecost is always talked about as being the time when you dedicate yourself to the Lord. Supposedly, uh, Abraham's uh, and Noah's dedication were on a Passover, or excuse me, Pentecost. Uh, we know from Jewish tradition that the law coming down on Mount Sinai from Moses was on a Pentecost. We know from Acts chapter 2, the age of grace began with the giving of the Holy Spirit on a Pentecost. So a 1335 is an idiom for a Pentecost. So in this case, you will have passed past the year 6000. You're now into the kingdom age. So if you are a human being, and you somehow escape death through the Antichrist, you're not, you would, didn't get saved before, so you went through the tribulation period, and you somehow managed to make it to the, the Pentecost right after the second coming, you would be able to, to enter into the kingdom covenant. And there's a lot of details in the scrolls about this, so it's a fascinating thing. It's a totally new system. Uh, we're still saved by faith. Christians are there. We're going to be immortal but it's a really interesting time. 
it's a good chance that the foundation stone will be set at that point. And then the 1230 or the 2300 days rather probably points to the time of the uh, dedication of the new temple or something else. We don't know for sure. But these are the days put together. So the main thing in this that I want you to understand is there's a difference between the time of trouble, which is the seven year tribulation period, the last seven years of our age before the second coming. The second coming is what actually ends it and makes it only seven years. Um, and then there are um, there's a rapture resurrection three and a half years later, an abomination of desolation three and a half years later, a second coming. And so that is a pre-trib rapture. And then the 1335 is described as entering the new covenant in that particular time period. So just wanted to cover that with you today, some interesting things. So we'll stop our study there for tonight.